Okay, Barry, come up here, please. Do you have your message with you? I do. Okay, good. Well, just, how, long, how long is your message? Um, about five minutes. You, go ahead and preach. No, it'll be a little longer than that. Okay, good. Good morning. I mean, uh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I am ready. Um, well, spiritually anyway, the flesh is weak. Um, as you all know, first of all, Thank you for the opportunity for letting me speak. It's good to see you all. It's good to be back here. Um, but I want to give you all a little fair warning. My, my preaching is atrocious, okay? So this message is titled, The Meaning of Life. On the first day, God created the cow. I told you, it's atrocious. But God said to the cow, you must go to the field with the farmer all day and suffer under the sun, have calves, and give milk to support the farmer. I will give you a lifespan of 60 years. The cow said, that's kind of tough life. You want me to live for 60 years? Why don't you let me have 20 years and I'll give you back the other 40? So God agreed. On the second day, God created the dog. God said, sit all day by the door of your house, bark at anyone who comes in or walks past, and I'll give you a lifespan of 20 years. The dog said, that's too long to be barking. How about you just give me 10 years and I'll keep the other 10? And you can keep the other 10. So God agreed. On the third day, God created the monkey. And God said, entertain people, do monkey tricks, make them laugh, I'll give you a 20 year lifespan. The monkey said, how boring. Monkey tricks for 20 years, really? I don't think so. Dog gave you back 10, so that's what I'll do too, okay? So God agreed again. And on the fourth day, God created man. And God said, eat, sleep, play, enjoy, do nothing. Just have fun. I'll give you a lifespan of 20 years. Man said, what? What do you mean 20 years? No way. Tell you what, I'll take that 20 plus... The 40 cave, uh, the cow gave back, the 10 that the dog gave back, and the 10 the monkey gave back. That makes 80 years, okay? God said, okay, you got a deal. So that, my family, is why for the first 20 years we eat, sleep, play, have fun, and do nothing meaningful. For the next 40 years we slave in the sun to support our family. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain our grandchildren. And for the last 10 years, we sit in front of the house and bark at anyone who comes past. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So let's begin with reading the word. Um, if you want to follow along, please turn to Matthew 27. We're going to read verses 11. 26. This is from the New King James Version. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do not hear how many do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word. So the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that he had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? 
And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged, scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings, your mercy, and your abundant grace. Father, we invite you here with us this night that your presence be manifested in all of our hearts and minds. Father, use me as your instrument this night, and let not my will be done, but yours only. Let your words flow through me. Let those who have ears hear your message and come to understand your word, Father, and provide a way for them to give their full attention, find the meaning of your message, that they may be able, to, able and willing to apply it in their lives. In your son's glorious name I pray, amen. So tonight's message is titled is about influence. Now, first of all, give me a show of hands of those of you who believe you have control over your own life. All right. You decide when it's time to wake up in the morning, right? You decide when it's time to go to bed. You decide when and what you want to eat, right? So let me ask it another way. Has anyone ever been influenced by something or someone? Your parents, siblings? Relationships, social, political, laws, economics, authorities, entertainment, technology, drugs and alcohol, weather, so much for having control. Now let's see how a show of hands for those who have been an influence in some form. Have you ever urged someone to do something? Have you ever noticed someone following your lead? One definition of influence is a power affecting a person, thing, or course of events, especially one that operates without any direct or apparent effort. Influence is a form of domination, power and control and manipulation, whether subtle or overt. So let me ask, who, who here has been an influence in some form? I know I was. If we, were able, if we were to take the time to count the number of things people who have influenced us just today, no doubt we would be here for a while. We were influenced by everything from our emotions to the weather, from our personal preferences to the clock on the wall. We were influenced by how hard or soft a chair is. But mostly we were influenced by the opinions of others. All kinds of things and people lead us in one form or another. From a 19th century English historian named Sir Leslie Stephen, he said, the best way in which one human being can properly attempt to influence another is to encourage him to think for himself instead of endeavoring to instill ready-made opinions into his head. And from the same time period, Charles Spurgeon said, the forms of evil are many. I need not mention them, for if I did, I might omit one, and then perhaps the person who is under its influence might fancy that I did not think it to be a sin. Dale Carnegie wrote in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. You can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years trying to get people interested in you. And Bob Dylan sings this song, going to change my way of thinking Make myself a different set of rules. Going to put my good foot forward and stop being influenced by fools. So you've all heard of the butterfly effect, right? Not the movie, but the theory that a small action can thereby have an ultimate effect on a greater action. Like the size, of a power, size and power of a, of a tornado being influenced by the flapping of wings of a distant butterfly. When we read of the events leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, we were made very aware that there were many influences 
surrounding these events. So many people were influenced, and like the butterfly effect, the influences of that specific event continue to this day. A man with influence has the ability to set forces in motions that never stop. So let's take note of a few of the influences of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. There is no way that we can address all the influences of that event, but maybe we can take a peek at some of the most influential. One, the influence of guilt on Judas that led him to suicide. Some have said that Judas had noble intentions in, his, in betraying Jesus. He thought he could speed up his political ascension to the throne of Israel. Some say that Judas really loved Jesus and was as much a victim as Jesus. I don't know about all that. What I do know is that Jesus referred to Judas as the son of perdition, which basically means the son of the devil. But most people are aware of how Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And after doing so, a powerful influencer began to move on Judas, the influencer of guilt. Charles Spurgeon said, The great destroyer of man is the will of man. I do not believe that man's free will has ever saved a soul, but man's free will has been the ruin of multitudes. Ye would not is still solemn accusation of Christ against guilty men. You can find that in Matthew 23, 37. He did not say, did he not say at another time, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life, in John 5, 40. The human will is desperately against, set against God and is the great devourer and destroyer of thousands of good intentions and emotions which never come to anything permanent because the will is acting in opposition to that which is right and true. So guilt is a good thing, though. God's Holy Spirit uses a feeling of guilt to move us towards Jesus Christ to find forgiveness for our wrongdoing. He uses shame to take us away from God. Virgin again, my sins are many, but oh, it is nothing to Jesus to take them all away. The weight of my guilt presses me down as a giant's foot would crush a worm. But it is no more than a grain of dust to him because he has already borne his curse in his own body on the tree. It will be but a small thing for him to give me full remission, although it will be an infinite blessing for me to receive it. The same guilt influenced Judas and Peter. No doubt Peter felt a sense of guilt after he had denied even knowing Jesus. However, these two men responded to the influence of guilt in two opposite ways. Judas went out and hanged himself. Peter found forgiveness from the resurrected Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied him. Both were lost children. Judas, no longer able to hold on to the truth that he remained God's child, hung himself. Peter in the midst of his despair, claimed it and returned it with many tears. Judas chose death. Peter chose life. But how many actually realize that this choice is always before us, constantly? So I encourage you, let the influencer of guilt do the work that God intended to show you the need for a Savior and a Redeemer. Point two, the influences that led Pilate to release Barabbas. Here we find another powerful influencer called tradition. Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites because of their tradition. When Matthew 15, I'll read verses 1 through 9, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your, tra why do your disciples transgress the tradition of of the elders. For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He, he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. 
hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophecy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. But tradition can also be a wonderful thing, especially in the form of an inheritance. Has anyone ever received an inheritance? It's a good feeling. Psalm 16.6 says, The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. It is, a, it is good to reflect upon the past and let nostalgia sweep through memory from time to time. The past always seems better when you look back on it than it did at the time. And the present never looks as good as it will in the future. But it can be depressing if you spend too much time reliving old joys. You may think you'll never have anything as good as again. Tradition, however, serves as an anchor. It reminds us of the mighty hand of God throughout history and how God has blessed us beyond measure. For Pilate, the tradition of releasing a prisoner at Passover became a great influencer. He, of course, eventually gave the crowd the option of releasing Barabbas or Jesus, and they chose Barabbas. Number three, the influence of Pilate's wife. Any man that says his wife does not influence him is either a liar or a fool. Since the Garden of Eden, men have been influenced by their wives, sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad. How many of you have been influenced by the women in their life? <laughs> Me too. This especially if you've lived with insecurities and low self-esteem. Insecurity is a form of slavery and demands that you be led around by the scruff of your collar, doing the bidding of whoever it is you're clinging to. Obviously not a healthy lifestyle. Both my wives have influenced me. I was a Klingon. I was very insecure and codependent. And not only did I allow myself to be influenced by my women in my life, by the women in my life, I would, credit, I would take the credit for whatever good came of it and in contrast, place blame for the bad. I suppose you guys can probably relate to that too. So it's understandable that Pilate's wife influenced him. There's a saying that behind every man of power stands a man, stands a woman in charge. The Bible proves this to be true even 2,000 years ago. Matthew 27, 19, when he, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. It is interesting to note here that Pilate tried to please everyone. I believe that his wife told him, I believe what his wife told him was just confirmation of what he already felt. He saw nothing that Jesus had done wrong to warrant the death penalty. And number four, the influence of the Jewish leaders on the multitude. Were it not for the influence that the chief priests and elders had on the crowd, they likely could not have they likely could not have had Jesus crucified. Um, the religious leaders knew nothing of a genuine relationship with God. Theirs was only a form of godliness that denied the power thereof. And feel free to read 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 5, and you'll get a much be better picture of what I'm referring to there. The Jewish leaders influenced the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas and the crucifixion of Jesus because they were jealous of his popularity. The popular Jesus became, or the more popular Jesus became, the more it threatened their control of the people. The influence of the crowd on Pilate is point number five. Here we have a purely political influence and response. Pilate was more concerned about his reputation than doing the right thing. He didn't want a Jewish uprising, especially with so many Jews in Jerusalem for the Passover. He wanted to make sure that Rome kept a good picture of him. He wanted no problems. He chose the path of least resistance. Pleasing people is all right, as long as it's not at the expense of doing what is right. So let's just say it like this. Pilate was a spineless people pleaser that didn't, want, didn't have the courage to do what was right. God is looking for some, some men and, and women and young people who know what is right 
and aren't intimidated by a twisted majority. When Pilate ultimately gave in to the crowds. Jesus went to the cross, but he went not for his sin, for he had none. He died on the cross for my sin and your sin. Well, that's the introduction. Now I'll start the sermon. All the influences we have examined tonight lead us to this. Point number six, the influence of Christ on humanity. No one has had a greater influence on history and the humanity than Jesus Christ. The following is the poem by Dr. James Allen, penned in 1926, titled One Solitary Life. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop. Until he was 30, he never wrote a book. I'm sorry. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from, where he was, from the place where he was born, and he did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves, while dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, which was the only property that he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today, Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, and all the kings that have ever reigned, all of that put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. But some would say they don't believe all this stuff about Jesus being the Son of God and dying for all the sins that have ever been committed. Well, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Some see Jesus and religion as a whole as being a great divider and source of many wars. Wikipedia tells me that there's 1,763 wars in all of history. Some commentators have concluded that only 123 of these 1,763 wars, which is just 7%, were fundamentally or originated by religious motivations. However, however you see Jesus, I see him as my savior. He died for me. He paid the price for my sin, and the historical proven fact of his resurrection has influenced the lives of millions upon millions. In conclusion, you may respond to his influence with curiosity, contempt, indifference, or acceptance. However you respond, though, one thing remains the same. The tomb where they laid Jesus is empty because he is risen. John 11, 25 through 26 says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So I say it to all you, let the word of God influence you to influence others. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.